if you had to appraise a prize string theory, I asked Mike Turner about inflation and dark energy recently, gave him the same thing. Give string theory uh, a grade, a report card, and uh, break it down into yeah. the sub categories of string theory. Where is yeah. it succeeded? Where does it need more work? And where is the parent teacher right. conference going to happen? The, <laughs> the only reason I'm laughing is because the 25th, and this is not a plug, folks, so it doesn't matter, but it's just because you asked the question. Yeah. The 25th anniversary edition of the Elegant Universe is coming out in August. And on the final pages of this new chapter I've written, I give string theory a report card. <laughs> so part of me is like, hey, I don't really want right, to spill the beans that, right okay. here, but, but I'll give you a rough feel for it. Yeah. So it's a good way of phrasing it because you need to judge a theory among uh, uh, many different criteria, right? And and some string theory has done extremely well and some it hasn't done as well. So let me start with the stuff where it hasn't done as well. Mm-hmm. When it comes to making contact with experimental data, the very question that we began with, string theory is not as far along as I would have hoped, right? So back in 1986, I don't want to calculate how many years ago that was, but it was a long time ago. And if you would have asked me then, and I think most string theorists at the time, 2023, are we going to know through experiment or observation whether these ideas are correct? 95% of the community would have said, of course, we'll know by then. And yet here we are, and, and we don't know. So on that, I would give a relatively low grade, but I'm going to come back to how I'll give the final grade on that in just a second, because the theoretical developments in string theory have been so astonishingly powerful, well beyond anything that I would have anticipated back in 1986. And one development in particular that no doubt you know something about because it's the most famous development in the last 20 years, this ADS-CFT correspondence by Juan Maldacena. And Ask actually, it's a, again, it's a whole great, it's a whole community of people, sure. of course, but Juan wrote the paper that really took the world by storm. The relevance of that, well, it's got a huge degree of relevance, but the relevance to the experimental question is interesting because once we learned, as we did with Juan's insight, that string theory is not as a radical separation from previous methodology as we once thought, which is a great development. There's a deep connection to older techniques that are still at the forefront because there are most powerful techniques, quantum field theory. Once you learn that quantum field theory and string theory are joined at the hip, which is what Juan showed us, quantum field theory is the most powerfully tested theory in the history of of particle physics, in the history of quantum mechanics. It's a framework that works. Tested in in what sense? Tested in terms of internal consistency, philosophical expediency, in what way has it been? I'm talking flat-footed here. Take Mm -hmm. the standard model of particle physics. It's Mm -hmm. a particular quantum field theory. And that particular quantum field theory makes predictions that we can confirm. I mean, the, uh, you know, take the magnetic moment of the electron, right? Decimal place. Yeah, that's, Mm -hmm. is is that not the most insane thing? I think it's the most accurately known number. Yeah, so, so, so think about the fact that you can do a calculation using this framework of quantum field theory, it agrees to observation to that many decimal places, right? So so that's the sense in which Mm -hmm. these ideas have been rigorously tested. When you learn that that framework is intimately connected to the framework of string theory, that they're not these two radically different things, which is what we initially thought, it doesn't prove string theory, of course, but it shows you that we are within the same universe of ideas all of a sudden. Mm. And that to me mitigates to some extent that string theory has not gone as far as we had hoped Mm. to actually make an experimental prediction that we can confirm. Mm. But the fact that it has joined together with the most experimentally tested approach, that is good, that's strong. So one of my favorite canards is that I feel like you, and I'm gonna say this, you know, some of my best friends are theorists. You know, I don't know if I'd let my daughter marry a theorist. But anyway, the 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 point of you know string theory and all of experimental or all of science within this context, scientific method, is to make some connection with reality. And yeah. the, as you call it, the fabric of reality, so beautifully and poetically. Um, but I feel like some of your ilk <laughs> yeah. have, and including I when I talked to Shelley Glashow on the podcast a couple of years ago, I said this to him as well. I feel like many of your colleagues, not you necessarily, have put what I call the toe before the gut. In other words, we are searching for a theory of everything, and, and string theory is a candidate theory of everything. I believe that's, that's safe to say. Um, and yet, and yet, 
necessarily have a grand unified theory that people agree with. I mean, Shelley had his SU5 and yeah. know, many different instantiations of it. But to my knowledge, and I'm just a humble experimentalist, but but tell me, why is there kind of, why do we skip? Yeah. You know, the, why aren't there as many people pursuing in the sociology of science, pursuing guts, grand unified theories, which would maybe can explain the difference between a theory of everything and a gut. But why are so many people yeah. ever indexing on feet, toes versus guts? <laughs> yeah. So first of all, I don't use that language much. I mean, sort of grand yeah, unification, sure. certainly, but TOE theory of everything is a term that I tend not to use very much, okay. really for sociological reasons, yeah. that if you're working on the theory of everything, then what is somebody who's not working on it <laughs> doing with theory their time? Of theory right. of nothing, you know, you know, so so I've never really warmed to that idea. But of course, that's not the point of your question. The question is, where should we be putting our energy? And the way I would say it is this, if Shelley's SU5, or if the other grand unified theories like SO10, for the people who are not in the know, these are just names of certain symmetry principles that equations can satisfy. And we've learned that symmetry is vital to formulating the laws of physics. And as we went further along in physics, we invoked ever more robust symmetries, and those are two examples of them. How those theories born fruit, that is, had their predictions been directly confirmed, which could have happened, right? Because George I, Glashow, and their approach, it predicted, their grand unification theory predicted that the proton should decay. And as we all know, we no searched for yet. that to get yeah. no sign yet. So, waiting. Yeah. So, that, that, so that was certainly, I think, sociologically, why people didn't just put all their energy into going in that particular direction. But I think that the, the deeper answer is that we've come to realize that to go further in physics, you've got to understand how gravity and quantum mechanics coexist. And all of the work on grand unification ignored the force of gravity. That was not the way that people were pursuing the next step in our understanding of physics. And so to leave out gravity is to leave out an essential part of the story. And when string theory came along and provided a means for putting gravity and quantum mechanics together, that was deeply alluring to so many people because now all of a sudden you weren't leaving anything out. Right. So it could be the biggest unification of all. And moreover, when we began to study string theory, we began to see the more conventional grand unified theories like George I and Glashow's SU5 and like SO10, we began to see those emerging from the unification of gravity and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And so it felt as though we can have our cake and eat it too, right? We can put gravity into the story and we can unify everything. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just push back with love and respect as I, uh, as my, I hope is my trademark, but say, imagine a counterfactual history where Shelley and Weinberg and Abdus are working and they say, well, we're not going to look at uh, electroweak unification until we can incorporate gravity and the strong force into it. Wouldn't we have been a stymied in flummox for an additional, who knows how, he could still be looking for electric weak unification. Two quick answers to that. One is absolutely, right? So I would never advocate that every single theorist <laughs> goes along and tries to get the big prize of putting gravity and quantum mechanics together. So, so certainly I, I would say that you do need people who are, more phenomenologically oriented, trying to come up with theories that are closer to data. And that's, of course, what Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg were doing. That was a time when the particle physics data was right there. It was right ready to talk about how do you put electromagnetism and the weak nuclear force together? Because after all, it was what, you know, 1979, I think, is when they get their Nobel Prize. Oh, yeah. But the paper itself was in the early 60s. 70s. Well, late 60s is Glashow, yeah, Glashow. And, and then early 70s. Oh, so it was only seven years away or something, eight years away. So the theory and the, the experiment were pretty close, mm -hmm. temporally speaking. So, so that's wonderful. You need people who are having this ongoing dialogue with phenomenology. And, and that's that is what was happening. Today, we are, as people often say, the victims of our own success. The open questions are at length scales that are so tiny, energy scales that are so huge that we simply don't have an accelerator that within seven years is going to probe the scales where the open questions currently lie. And that's why we've gone 
so far beyond what experimenters can do. And that's why here we are 40 years later with string theory, and I don't have any experiment to show for it. <laughs>